This is a podcast by the Business Times, presented by HSBC Singapore. According to the Monetary Authority of Singapore's managing director Ravi Menon, the first half of 2023 will be tough globally and in Singapore. The combination of high inflation and slower growth means that the risk of stagflation cannot be discounted. But there are still bright spots in Singapore's fintech sector and countries and businesses that adapt to these structural shifts by investing in digitalization, sustainability, and human capital to capture new growth areas would thrive. As a leader in transaction banking for trade finance clients, HSBC believes every challenge is an opportunity. Transaction banking is perhaps one of the most important components of a company's growth. But what are the challenges? What information should decision makers have to make the right choices on their business's digitalization journey? Today we speak with Cheyenne Hazer, Chief Digital Officer ASEAN, HSBC Singapore to find out. Welcome to the Business Times Future of Finance podcast. Cheyenne, thank you for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Let's talk about digital transformation as it pertains to business transformation. What are some of the challenges companies continue to tackle on their transformation journeys? It's a really broad subject, and I'm quite conscious when I'm asked this question how to whittle down to what are those key areas that corporates and particularly uh, small businesses struggle with as they embark on this journey. So I think it's really important to understand that when you look at the sector now, particularly around technology, things are moving so quickly that organizations need to be extremely adaptable, agile, and flexible as they go and evolve into, let's say, new markets. So they go and expand into other markets outside of Singapore, or they're looking to add new product segments within the existing product categories that they have. So that requires, again, a switch into new areas of managing logistics differently, maybe a new manufacturing process. And then when you're looking at like going out to the market nowadays, you have so many opportunities to partner with, let's say, e-commerce players that are out there, which would then give you and enable you to expand much faster than you would traditionally if you were to do it yourself. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that there are immense opportunities out there in terms of how a company would experience growth now. And particularly when you look at digital as a means to your growth trajectory, there are so many different ways in in which to do it that it's really about selecting the best possible option for your sector, your industry, and your products. That kind of agility, flexibility, and quick decision-making is what mostly businesses are challenged with today. And at HSBC, I think one of the core areas which we focus on when we're working with corporates is to really help them navigate this space. We had a a HSBC Navigator series, uh, which was a study done for thousands of businesses across Southeast Asia. And it said that the internet penetration in Southeast Asia is more than 75%. And the entrepreneurial culture and tech-led business models are increasing at an exponential pace. And really, Southeast Asia is becoming like a global sandbox of activities and creating new alliances, new partnerships, network effects that you can get from these partnerships and alliances. And really, as a bank, we need to expand our capabilities beyond just being financial service providers and becoming that trusted advisor to our corporates so that we can help them navigate this space, navigate transformation, navigate growth. Cheyenne, the digitalization push has been going on for some time. I'm sure businesses have taken those first steps, but what might be the most pressing challenge to overcome? What should they prioritize? That's a great question. And I think when you think about what are they challenged with and what are the core challenges, there could be three areas we look at. So one, why do companies die? In most cases, they die because they don't have cash. So working capital, actually, and managing working capital is one of the core areas to keep businesses afloat. Typically, what happens is you get caught up in the majesty of growth and, and, you know, you get sucked into, you know, looking at big venture capitalist investments and you're trying to go out there and make a name for your product and service and you're getting the attention. But really, bricks and mortar down to the wire to keep businesses running, you need to have strong working capital when you don't have a clear strategy for it, it becomes something that will creep up on you. And then you realize, 
we actually don't have cash. So managing your inflows, how you're receiving funds from your customers and the outflows in terms of things like supplier payments. Again, we really have to work closely with organizations to manage that working capital inflow and outflow and then manage the liquidity that is the net impact of both of those two parameters. And so If you look at trade finance and cash management, those are two core areas, i.e. transaction banking, where our products really need to build in that just-in-time capability to provide fast access to trade and working capital, but also at the same time be able to provide the visibility that customers need on a single platform so that they can take those quick decisions and and make those you know changes very quickly in terms of uh, managing their working capital so that's one core area i think that both corporates as well as banks need to be working closely on addressing i give you an example of dksh a leading market expansion services provider for companies that are seeking to grow their business in asia and beyond They work with us to implement a digital collection solution. And since launching this new payment solution, DKSH has transformed the way they actually interact with their customers. They're delivering smarter, faster, friction-free services. They've also kind of worked with us to create a just-in-time supplier payment solution, which allows them to, you know, make sure that they stretch their cash as far as they possibly can, allowing them to have greater flexibility in working capital. So these are two examples, both from the receiver end and the supplier end, we are able to add value to customers. If working capital is the first challenge, are there more? And which might be the most pressing to tackle? The second point I want to talk about is internationalization. The idea is that you need a partner that's going to help you navigate new markets. And when you look at the region, I mean, 680 million people, of which most of them are technology savvy, you can actually access new markets completely digitally. And we've seen a number of startups expand out into Southeast Asia in a very organic way by just opening up offices and being able to actually have boots on ground and kind of create that local domestic play. But you need to have a banking partner uh, who's capable of addressing the regulatory landscape, the tax environment, be able to support and navigate in terms of account opening, getting those central bank approvals or supporting you to get those central bank approvals when, when you need them. So there's a lot to do when you when you land into a new market. And when you think about what challenges that addresses, you need probably a one-stop solution to do that. And so we really pride ourselves on our network in Southeast Asia to be able to link customers to these new opportunities in these new markets. We also have a lot of connectivity digitally. So you don't actually, in this day and age, need to have a local setup to be able to execute what you need to do to expand to a new market. You can actually do that digitally. This could be opening up partnership with local vendors, using them as your logistical channel, or it could be a way in which you set up your payments out of Singapore using, for example, our global wallet proposition, which allows you to pay as a local in in different markets. So you don't have to go through these complex payment infrastructures in each market differently. For example, we launched Global Wallet in Singapore uh, last year, and we also have that ability to pay in Malaysian ringgit locally in Malaysia. So that kind of flexibility of internationalization requires you know, new innovative products to be able to help you do that. And very quickly, I'll touch on the third thing, which is the biggest challenge, and that's mindset. Innovation moves faster than we can take action sometimes. Innovation requires a lot of persistence. It requires a lot of courage. And a lot of organizations sometimes lose patience in terms of going out there and trying to, you know, do something new, create new uh, opportunities for their business, because it takes a lot of energy and time. I would say that in order to really take advantage of technology, you need to have that creative mindset to be able to apply new technology to your business models and be open to change. Web3 comes to mind. Embedded finance comes to mind. Things like data, AI, and machine learning comes to mind. How do these technologies help optimize your business models? That should be a question on every entrepreneur's mind, every business owner's mind. And again, at HSBC, we want to help you navigate that space. Market conditions are constantly changing. When we come back, we take a closer look at how companies can be more resilient through digitalization and transformation. This episode of Future of Finance is presented by HSBC Singapore. And now back to the podcast. 
We're speaking with Cheyenne Hazer, Chief Digital Officer ASEAN, HSBC Singapore, on the subject of digital transformation as it pertains to business transformation. Cheyenne, market conditions are constantly changing. How can businesses evolve quickly enough to remain resilient? Yeah, I mean, great question. And I'd say that volatility has always been a part of business. There's never been a time when you go back to 2008 and you think about the financial crisis all the way to now, there would have been a series of events that have taken place that have impacted regions, countries, you know, global macroeconomic indicators on a regular basis. And what we see is that you must be able to adapt. And the pandemic showed this like no other in the last three years about how businesses shifted business models, you know, everything from delivering services and products to being able to educate your kids online. I mean, this was something done almost overnight. The lessons from COVID, for example, are going to linger for many, many years to come because geopolitical risks will always remain. That's the world we live in, as, as people call it, a VUCA world, right, where everything is volatile and it's ambiguous and, and we're trying to make sense of the chaos. But businesses must draw a line of best fit through these shocks and be able to address the changing needs of not only the market, but also for customers. And why I feel that digital is so key to that is because its adaptability is inherent in digital. Like imagine having to recalibrate thousands of people, feet on street, people working in factories, versus just upgrading your AI, being able to switch from one platform to the next. These things become very intuitive in a business when it's built on a strong technology stack. So the real challenge is, do businesses today have the right technology stack that would allow them to be agile enough to take advantage, in fact, of geopolitical risks rather than just react to them? Specifically for the financial services sector, what technologies do you anticipate taking off? And perhaps you can outline why you think so. <laughs> I'm a bit of a technology buff in terms of like, I'm not an expert in any of them, but I'd say I'm a jack of all trades to be interested in terms of how they interact with each other. So three areas which I see have huge value in the way financial services will evolve. The first one is Web3 and decentralized finance. The second one would be around embedded finance. And the third would be around data and how we use algorithmic legibility in terms of driving our business models and our customer behavior analysis. So those three areas are really, in my opinion, going to move the way we interact with clients as a financial institution, but also in the way they interact with their customers. So it's going to be revolutionary changes, I'd say, in the next five to eight years. I think from a perspective of Web3, I'll focus in on digital assets. Today is a day where you can actually tokenize anything. You can fractionalize anything. These could be, you know, securities and commodities. For example, we did a bond issuance with SGX and Temasek two years ago, I would say. I think it was in 2020. And that was really around being able to tokenize the entire bond issuance process, which would make it much more secure, much more efficient and make it easier for organizations to manage a very complex process. Because you can imagine about millions of people that would be impacted by uh, issuing a bond, right? So all of that value chain can be made much more efficient using tokenization. And also real world assets. You think about real estate, you think about artworks, you think about wine collections. That kind of ability to turn those kind of real world assets into tokens and having them in your wallet and being able to authenticate their ownership in your mobile phone using an app, that is really powerful in the way in which those assets can be traded, authenticated, and also how you would build your wealth. I think the second really interesting area is embedded finance. We are already in partnership with NetSuite, which is Oracle NetSuite globally to offer financial services through their platform. So somebody who's using Oracle NetSuite ERP in previous years had to actually leave that experience and then use another app or another mobile platform or another web app platform to conduct their banking. But being able to now offer almost white-labeled or latent banking services embedded into Oracle NetSuite means an SME now can make their payments seamlessly using the same platform. So they never have to leave that experience. And that's something to be said about 
you know, having a fantastic user experience. And you're going to, again, hear a lot more in this space as organizations realize that there's huge value in providing financial services as an offshoot to their existing experience. You're already hearing about third-party payment aggregators providing banking services to merchants. You're hearing about buy now, pay later companies now, which are proliferating. But at the same time, they're also offering lending capabilities to their merchants so that they can expand on their businesses. So we've worked with the likes of Atome, for example, in Singapore to be able to help them, you know, with over a $100 million facility to expand their business in the space. So while we might not be as a bank providing direct loans to the smaller players in the MSME space, we can do that through BNPL players. So that helps us expand our market as well. So it's a win-win in embedded finance. And data and AI is such a huge subject. Like I can talk about it for hours, but really what I really want to talk about is behavioral signals. Behavioral signals that can be extracted in terms of analyzing huge quantities of data. So let's say our payments data, our trade finance data, our credit data, card payment data, and you kind of merge all of that and then put an AI layer on top of it, you can actually know sometimes and predict how a customer's needs will change and evolve. So you know you can be there to support them even before that event takes place. So I think that kind of predictive analytics is going to be hugely powerful in the way a hyper-personalized environment will work for any business in the future. This may be difficult for the man in the street to comprehend. How will these new innovations benefit consumers? I think of financial services in the future becoming democratized the way in which your Spotify is today. That even though it's a platform that's holistic, when you actually build your playlist, you feel like it belongs to you. And so when people actually address Spotify, they address it as my Spotify because the recommendation engine working in it is creating a hyper-personalized experience for you. So your tastes, your moods, your needs are being addressed in the way that you probably couldn't have done prior to the way algorithms can analyze them at this point in time. So when you combine Web3, you combine embedded finance, you combine data and algorithms and AI layers, Within the regulatory and policy guardrails, you'll be able to create a hyper-personalized experience for your customers. And that, in my mind, will address the needs of consumers at the retail level, small players like MSMEs, but also help larger customers understand their clients better because of this flow of data. So I think the whole financial services industry is going to go through this revolution and it's really going to take place from now up to the next five to eight years. We've been speaking with Cheyenne Hazer, Chief Digital Officer ASEAN, HSBC Singapore, on the future of finance. Cheyenne, thank you for the information and the insights. It's been a pleasure. Sure. Thank you for having me. On behalf of the BT Podcast team, thank you for joining us on the future of finance. This episode of Future of Finance was presented by HSBC Singapore. That was a podcast from the Business Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcast or, via the Google Voice Assistant Amazon-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times, and Money FM 89.3 you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties' products and services. Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.